Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to uh, welcome to week four of our journey through Christian church history, the, uh, the Crusades era through the Reformation. Um, if you have made it thus far, I congratulate you. <laughs> Uh, the material is sometimes complex, a lot of facts and figures. Sometimes it's not the most pleasant material to go through. Um, let me just remind you of my standard disclaimer. The historical portion of this, which is hopefully something like 95% of it, I hope, the historical portion of it comes from the best and probably most recent solid academic scholarship, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, I, I try to present what is believed to be fact. I will often tell you that dates are approximate because, you know, not that we do this today, but occasionally in, in, in olden days, people tended to fudge the numbers a little bit. So just because we have a historical primary source record doesn't always mean the people who wrote it down were telling the absolute truth. Sometimes later scholarship will trump earlier scholarship on exact dates. That's one disclaimer. The other disclaimer is that I believe it's actually impossible to present information without it slanting one way or the other. People's personality and their opinions, sometimes just by tone of voice, manage to get through. That's the case here also. Um, it is possible that my opinions on these events are different than your own. It is also quite likely that my theological take on some of these events will be different than some of yours. I try to keep that out of it. It is probably not 100% possible that I try. However, if you ask my opinion on something, I promise you, I will let you have it. <laughs> right. So, um, those are the disclaimers. The only other disclaimer is um, we are being we are being videotaped so that folks who miss this or want to review it can see it. There's a website for that. You can find a link uh, at the church website um, uh, about uh, from about uh, there's about physical farms to about halfway through the church, this is all kind of within the lens of the camera. If you object to being on the tape, tell me afterwards, I preferably write it down so I don't forget it. As V.D. King said, put it on a piece of paper so it can be read to me. Um, and I'll try to pixelate you out or to make a comment you don't want her, I'll try to take it out. Um, otherwise, just know that it's a, a, a you know, we are uh, being uh, taped. You know, we do have we do have the ability to do the you know 60 second bleep or the instance of deleting all the mixed tapes if necessary. We don't do any screen credit. Uh, you know, if, if, if you were a member of the Screen Actors Guild, uh, let me know. We'll see about that. Okay. Um, however, this is a 501 c 3 nonprofit organization, so. Um, Chances are that's all you'll get. Okay, since I can't think of anything else either germane or humorous to say, let's just go ahead and start with the prayer for that. Well, Father, we give you thanks and we praise for this new day and for your mercies which you give to us each and every morning. Lord, we also thank you for gathering us together. We thank you for the interest that you instill in us. Lord, as we study um, history, our history, mm -hmm. your history, History, the history of our forebearers, we ask that you might guide us, give us open minds, open spirits, and open hearts. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so um, we have um, the, uh, just, just to begin a little bit of uh, review. Last week, if you recall, we started with the marvelously cheerful topics of the Black Plague. Uh, that, by the way, is a proper name for that thing. Uh, some people will call that the bubonic plague. However, if you recall, the bubonic version was only one of several <coughs> editions that were related to that. So, black plague, 
uh, and then of course the first part of the of the Inquisition. Um, and we'll be going on after a little bit of review to talk about the probably more famous uh, so-called Spanish Inquisition. Um, that that slide, by the way, uh, I'm not sure if you can read it uh, from here, uh, from where you are. Uh, Excunge domine et judica causam tuam, which uh, means rise up, O Lord, and judge your own cause. Uh, that is uh, uh, taken from uh, uh, Psalm 73, uh, maybe I could say appropriated from Psalm 73, but uh, at any rate, that became the motto. That became the motto of the Spanish <coughs> Um So just to review just a little bit. Uh, the term medieval inquisition describes any number of various inquisitions Various inquisitions that started at approximately 1184 under Pope Lucius III. Uh, you know, by now I have this thing about these Pope names. Popes get to choose these really cool names like Innocent and, and, and Pious, and this one decided to call himself uh, Lucius. Um, we had it was called an Episcopal Inquisition. It has nothing to do with the Episcopal Church. That wasn't invented yet. Episcopal simply means rule by bishops. The Episcopal Inquisition, the first part of the medieval Inquisition, essentially what happened is the Holy See allowed the various dioceses, the uh, parts of the geography ruled by individual bishops, to govern those Inquisitions themselves. That gave way, partly because of reasons of chaos and non-standard practice, to something called the Papal Inquisition. In other words, the Pope said, well, we're going to now appoint inquisitors. We're going to appoint official people to do this work, since you guys can't do it on your own. The Inquisition, the medieval Inquisition, was a response, at least the official reason given, was that it was a response to uh, the growing popularity of certain groups that were considered heretical. Uh, some of the most uh, well-known, we had the, uh, the Cathars. That's a, uh, a Cathar coin, actually. Uh, if you recall, the Cathars were a dualist group. Okay? They understood the world to have been created not by God, as in the God of Abraham and Isaac, but rather by a demiurge that was essentially evil. The Cathars believed the world was created, the world being all the physical substance, including and especially our fleshly bodies, created by a demiurge. Um, however, there was another God, the one they worshipped. Um, who found his person in Jesus Christ. They were dualists, right? Dualists, makes sense. They have uh, an evil force and a good force. Um, the Cathars, that you may have heard absolutely nothing about, uh, because they were almost completely eradicated. The, the Inquisition, whatever you might think of it, worked, as far as the Cathars are concerned. Um, however, in their day, they um, might have been considered a serious threat by the Roman Catholic Church. You can see the spread of what we call Catharism throughout Europe. You can see territories, uh, particularly, uh, well, let's see, in France, in, in Italy, um, there, uh, there, there are quite a few. There are still relics, by the way, of their churches to this day, uh, monuments, uh, physical remnants, as well as some theological remnants of Cathars. By the way, Cathar comes from the Greek Catharsis, uh, which is also our English word, Catharsis, meaning to cleanse. Um, the other group, the other major religious group that the Inquisition targeted were the, uh, were the Waldenses. Uh, Waldenses, a man uh, by the name of Waldo. Uh, with a theology, by the way, very similar 
to Reformation theology. For example, the belief that scripture should be available to be read by the common man in a language which he could understand. Believe that there was no particular and special blessing above and beyond everyone else that an ordained person received. They rejected ideas such as transubstantiation. They rejected uh, much of the hierarchical system of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, in, in short, we might surmise that had Waldo and his followers not been as suppressed as they were, the Reformation, one might have happened very differently, and might have happened several centuries earlier. Uh, you can see their geographical area. There they, there's a, a kind of a fanciful, old-fashioned map of, of, of Italy, right in the center. Uh, it's, it's not all that clear up here, but that, that, that building-like thing right in the middle of the Italy's boot is Rome. Okay? That's the Holy See there. And then up towards north of that, you will find a uh, 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 okay, And that was kind of the home territory of the Wallaces, the followers of Wallace. The Wallaces were not completely eradicated. And to this day, you can go to Europe, to South America, um, to uh, Africa, and find some Wallace churches. Uh, very small, typically very insular. Um, but again, with a theology, it sounds a lot like the 16th century. So they were the primary targets of the European Inquisition. Um, beyond that, we had other groups which, interestingly enough, were originally sanctioned by the Roman Catholic Church, most notably the Knights Templar. Um, they were also targets of the Inquisition. Um, uh, to continue our review, legal basis for the activities of the Inquisition came in large part from Pope Innocent the Fourth's papal bull. Papal bull, by the way, is, 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 um, is uh, an invitation for a joke, obviously, but, uh, but also is essentially an announcement. The bull, think of bull like bulletin. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, so uh, in 1252, the Pope says it's okay, it's okay to torture people to get the truth. That's okay. Um, it's also, by the way, maybe important to note, I don't think I brought this up last week, it's important to note that using torture to get at the truth is not something that was invented by Rome, as in the Roman Church. It was not something that was invented by Catholicism. And it was not unique to the inquisitorial courts. As a matter of fact, at that particular space and time, we're talking about, say, the 12th century through the 15th or 16th centuries, by the way, onwards, it was not at all uncommon in any European judiciate to use torture to get at the truth. That's just, that's just how they did it. Um, and, and it would have given you a lot of justifications for why it was a good thing. Uh, that's, that pretty much concludes our review on this one question. We pause your questions or comments. Questions, comments? Well, if you if you if you look if you look at where if you look at where they're they're located, it's not a great map, admittedly, it's not a great map, but if you look at where they're located, okay. Now we've got France over here. We kind of move upwards towards what? The famous mountain range. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, made their, they made their way in. They did make their way in. There are probably still a few tiny communities again, throughout Northern Europe, um, some in France, some in uh, probably in Northern Italy, um, some emigrated to avoid persecution. Uh, so you'll find in the South America of all places. Um, again, very small communities. Very useful communities. One of their uh, uh, tenets was that they believed that uh, people who were teachers or clergy persons within the church should not be connected in any way to political office or to anything considered grand, like big business, for example, in, in the secular world. 
As a result, the whole demeanor of the group is one of, of uh, humility in the sight of the world. They tend not to build large cathedrals. They tend not to uh, do the things that church bodies would do to uh, um, uh, distinguish themselves. Other questions? Okay. If not, I'm going to move on to the so-called Spanish Inquisition. Um, so, fanciful, somewhat famous painting of uh, what uh, heretics brought before the Holy See, what, what it might have looked like. Um, that actually happens to be a slightly off topic, uh, but nonetheless, chronologically appropriate uh, picture of Galileo being brought before the Holy See. Sorry, yes, I, I just got in. Yep. So, what was the end result of this inquisition? What 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 happened as a result of it? To well, the um, the inquisition officially officially didn't end in the beginning of the twentieth century. Okay. Um, however, uh, the results were that the bars. The medieval uh, Inquisition in, in Europe, outside of Spain, or the Jewish uh, Islam, the Cathars were eradicated. The um, uh, the Wallaces were kind of uh, forced into suppression or, or, or exile. Um, difficult to stand not completely, probably because they were so old. Um, Knights Templar were left in um, ruins, kind of making a shadowy group. Knights Hospitalar. Gone essentially. Um, yeah, the Inquisition, unlike the Crusades, I suppose, was successful in the sense that it managed to uh, suppress its, its, its targets. Um, we'll see, however, that things uh, changed rather uh, drastically in the Spanish Inquisition. Um, Thank you. Sure. Uh, European Inquisitions. On the 13th and 14th, I guess I should also say very late 12th century, but 1184 is the date most modern scholars give the beginning of the medieval Inquisitions. Uh, the European Inquisitions generally did not reach uh, Spain, not reach the Iberian Peninsula. Um, the Inquisitions that we were talking about last week and earlier today, ostensibly, the purpose was to uh, was to correct heresy. Hence, attacking the Cathars, the Walmses, uh, eventually they found heresy, what they claimed to be heresy in the Knights of Bar. Um, attack heresy in the belief that it's important for Christians to have uh, um, uh, orthodox beliefs. All have to believe the same. Um, that's the ostensible purpose. So, heretics. Um, individuals, typically you've got to be a heretic in the mind of the European position. If, if you had some Christocentric belief system. For example, if you said, well, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. Let's just come up with some the favorite uh, 13th century Christians. You say you're a Christian, but you believe that Jesus was actually only spirit, not also flesh, but only spirit. That, by the way, is an old heresy. It was in the first century, second century heresy. But it crops up by the time even today. So um, that belief would have been considered a heresy. You claim to be a Christian. But you don't believe in the same Christ as the church does. The Roman Catholic Church, of course, like most mainline denominations, says that Jesus is true God, spirit, God of spirit, but also um, uh, flesh, true man. That's the official understanding. So a belief in only a spirit God would be a heresy. Um, the belief that Jesus was at some point a human being who did really well and was adopted by God. Interestingly enough, called adoptionism. That would be considered a heresy. 
By the way, that one is not, it's not that prevalent in the Western church, but fairly prevalent in the Eastern church. Um, those are examples of fairly common heresies. So people who say they're Christians, but have a different theological take. Okay? Um, interestingly enough, um, Muslims, Jews, well, they were persecuted, to be sure. They were not necessarily targets of the Inquisition, the, the, the European, the evil Inquisition. Partly because it didn't have to be. It was very easy to persecute them in other ways. Um, I don't mean necessarily say they had it, uh, their lives were uh, easy streets, I said. However, the Inquisition in Europe was mostly concerned with kind of internal policing. Now, Spain was, was kind of unique. It's kind of unique in Western Europe um, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is its racial diversity. Think about where Spain is, but I should have had a map here, I'm sorry. Uh, think about where Spain is located. If you were saying in southern Spain, it is a comparatively short boat trip to where? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't remember those places. You, you can get a lot of places from the southern tip of the Iberian Peninsula, right? So it was uh, kind of a, a cultural, a cultural polyglot. There were lots of things going on, lots of cultures, lots of languages, and at least a few religions. So Spain has a large Muslim population. They have the Single largest Jewish community. Uh, 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 one source estimated that at about 100,000. Others didn't have a quite higher estimates. But anyway, you look at it, the largest Jewish population in any one place. Um, they got along, kind of. Um, specifically, the Jews had to live in their own communities. The Muslims tend to live in their own communities, and the Christians tend to live in their own communities. And from time to time, as necessity arose, they would trade with each other. There were even a few cases of um, intermarriage. Um, not encouraged, it didn't happen. So, so they were kind of getting along. Occasional swallows, of course. They were basically getting along, uh, and had done so for, for centuries. Anthony? Yes? If uh, Spain had about, say, 100,000 <coughs> Jews, could you venture a guess as to how many Muslims and how many Christians? Uh, Christians numbering in millions. Not the high, not, not 90 million, probably 7 or 8 million. Okay? Uh, Muslim population. I'm not certain, but certainly smaller than the Jewish population. Okay. Um, yes. uh, we were in Spain, mm -hmm. we were in the Yeah. Um, the synagogue mm -hmm. that is there was the last one mm -hmm. left standing, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Um, just, just, on, just on that point, um, the, the Jewish community in Spain prior to the Spanish Inquisition, um, they built a lot of this. They built some beautiful buildings. Um, they, 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 they did some amazing things architecturally. They did some amazing things in terms of, of, of science, in terms of medicine. That's a whole other study, by the way. European Jewish culture. Some, some amazing stuff. The, the interplay philosophically. Remember, in any kind of religious community, there are those who say, my way is right, I refuse to talk to anybody else. And there are also those who are willing to say, well, okay, fine. Tell me about your God. And, and, and that is where Norris whether you believe that to be right or wrong, action, what is undeniable is that is where incredible scholarship happens. That's where incredible understanding happens. 
Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, so, 1391 riots. Um, <coughs> a lot of times, the original versions of the notes I have by Wednesday nights are like 35 pages long. I can, I can get into all the reasons. It's dizzying, and, and, and it's also some of today because <coughs> you get the finer points, and again, opinions, even the most scholarly and historical folks' opinions start to fly around. Suffice it to say, 1391 riots. The interesting thing about the riots is the riots were in many ways a reaction to something that really didn't have a lot to do with the Jews. You see, it seems the, uh, the Spanish monarchy was kind of those two separate kingdoms, for that moment, um, two separate kingdoms there. It was starting to say, hey, I don't know if we like having Muslims around. And the Muslims would say, well, we have as much right to be here as you. We don't think we like to do our own. And there's ineffective fighting, it's ineffective at this point. But the common people, all they know is they're angry at people who are not like them. And just think about them, they take it out on the Jews. That's a huge oversimplification, by the way. Huge oversimplification. But it is the crux of it. So, 1391. All of a sudden, everybody's angry with the Jews. What is it? Um, is it uh, Tevia? Or Pillar on the Roof? Oh God, I know you're a chosen people. Yeah, I have to choose us so much. <laughs> um, again, with the Jews. The end results of the, these riots were. Uh, uh, Peculiar period of mass conversion. You know, I mean, on the one hand, it sounds pretty good, right? Say, well, how do, you, how do you get rid of venom? Make them your friend. You, you know, I, I've, heard, I've heard preachers say, why well, are we going to do out of the Islamic rat? As if that were a lot of us. We're just going to convert them all, that's what we're going to do. Well, that's certainly more than the most of But the problem arises when the people you think you'd like to convert don't particularly want to be converted. However, um, might makes right, or someone should tell us, might makes right, and uh, Christian population is larger, in charge of the government, by the way, and, and they essentially force baptize, uh, force baptize Jews. Either by literally manhandling them to it, or by saying, well, get baptized, or your other choices are, we'll kill you, or you have to just uh, be exiled, leave here. So we now have this huge Jewish population, certainly huge by medieval standards, huge Jewish population is now Nominally, you know, in name, but nominally Christian. Um, so, 14th century, late 14th century Jewish converts, they're called um, conversos, let's hold it for you, the conversos, cristianos nuevos, or the more scornful term, um, malanos. So the Romanos, it's a word in Spanish now. If you have a tough time translating it, if you use a translation program or whatever, Romanos uh, comes from Romano, comes from uh, originally from Arabic, and um, it means pig. So the uh, Christian population, the Gentile population, say when they wanted to insult the new converts to Christianity. Because hey, we're old Christians that work themselves, old Christians. You know, my father was a Christian, my grandfather was a Christian, his father before. You guys are new Christians. 
Não é você dizer, ah, você vê. Vamos lá, mano. O que é isso? That, uh, I think that epithet in terms of its forcefulness would have been the equivalent of, uh, a, you know, what does they call it? The uh, N word. Okay. Um, so, the, um, the stigma of being wedded with the aunt would be to kind of remain with a family for a while, a generation or two. But over time, over time, what was interesting is that um, uh, eventually people assimilate, particularly when they're forced to do so. So they start becoming, if not Christians, I'm not sure how we define that uh, in this context. You know, with the Mass, they uh, probably had a crucifix somewhere in our house, they rosary beads, but they become more Spanish, more like the prevailing culture. But it, it's kind of, uh, kind of interesting. Because it often happens when people who are forced to assimilate, they, um, they get extremely well. They were industrious. They educated themselves. They did well in business. They did well in the government. They did well in the sciences, such as they were. They did well in the arts. And, 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 and all of a sudden, we have um, we have some jealousy going on. Okay, by the 15th century, 15th century, Spain is now engaged in trying to reconquer, as they put it, the southernmost regions, the bottom of the Iberian Peninsula. They're saying, okay, we finally had it with these Muslims. We want them out here. So they're, 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 they're saying, that's it. And part of that is now we have the, the two kingdoms. I talked about that previously. So two different kingdoms. We've got, we've got, we've got, we've got, we've got, we've got, they're united through the, um, through the uh, marriage of, of, of two very famous people, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella. Uh, Isabella was uh, queen of the seal. Ferdinand, king of Aragon, they marry and reunite the kingdoms. Um, they finally, finally conquer the Muslim, last Muslim stronghold, big Muslim stronghold of uh, Renata in uh, 1492. So, just out of curiosity, what, what else happened in 1492? <laughs> oh, yes! Cristóbal de Colón sailed the ocean river. Well, just as an aside, just as an aside, um, why did why did call on a suicide thing? Please don't please nobody tell me to prove the world is right. Riches. What is it? Riches. 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 They're looking for a short break route to the bar. Okay. I'm trying to break through properly with the spice on That's good. There we go. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that was a tall hall ride. I mean, it's always, um, you know, you can hear it's a uh, you know, financial game. It's kind of large term. But yes, it has to do with how do we get, how do we, how do we get a, 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 a better, quicker, more economical, ergo leading to more profitable, way to get to all those spices and other things that we want in the Indians, the Paul Indians. Well, I don't know. Um, you, you know, who, who, who am I to say? I, mean, I just have a little tiny boat to sail and use it just up and down the East Coast. It's not even inside sight of land. So I can't really criticize his navigation skills. But man, is he off! Yeah. 
I mean, what? Walk like 8,000 miles. I mean, I mean, you know, occasionally I'll, occasionally I'll uh, sail a little farther than I think I'm going to, you know, and I, I, the worst I have to do is get my cell phone and say, I'm going to get away for dinner, okay? Um, but, uh, yeah, it was off. Well, Columbus was an interesting fellow. He was an autodidact. Autodidact and self taught. And there's an interesting thing about autodidacts. There are those who say the problem with autodidacts is that it allows you patience. <laughs> well, uh, Columbus was um, probably not a particularly scholarly man. He didn't have all that much formal education. However, he was apparently fascinated by knowledge, studied endlessly. However, without guidance from the outside, he came up with ideas that even in his day were considered just playing off. Well, among the things that fascinated Columbus was jewelry. Not jewelry, but jewelry. He was fascinated by the Jews, by the plight of the Jews, and by the place of the Jews in what he believed to be scriptural prophecy. So there is a theory that I remain agnostic about because there's not enough information yet. But it's an interesting theory. Let's throw it out there for you. I really don't have a formal opinion on this yet, but uh, give, me, give me a few months. There is a theory that some of Columbus' motivation was that he was looking for a place for the Jews. And it wouldn't be bad if he found a better way to get those spices out of there <laughs> along the way. But he hoped that he might be able to do something about, uh, you know, if there's still God's chosen people, salvation is of the Jews, writes Paul. Surely they must have some place in God's heart and mind more than being beat up able to steal. So, just a theory. Just something to think about. Um, in the kingdom of the steel, the anti Semitic sentiment just become enormous. Now, again, I guess I'm sliding on the table a little bit here, but stuff like that is not today, right? Uh, I mean, we're angry at one group of foreigners, so we kind of lump them all together. Don't make any foreigners. Um, that's kind of how we felt. A lot of anti Muslim sentiments, even though they got them out of that. The enemy, the Moors, hate those people. They don't believe in our God. Oh, wait, who else doesn't believe in our God? All these Jews hanging around here. So, that's the flavor of the time. Turn the clock back a little bit. 1478, Friedrich and Isabel request a papal bull. No jokes, please. They request a papal bull establishing an inquisition. Remember, Spain had hitherto been spared all this inquisition stuff. Request an inquisition was granted. And the inquisition had been placed under a Dominican friar by the name of Thomas. Pokemonda. Pokemonda, who, by the way, is nothing like Pokemon the Bible. <laughs> you know, I was going to take two pieces of pot media and interweave them into this presentation. Unfortunately, my wife won't have it. <laughs> the first one was I was going to I was, I was play a song by Bob Dylan. With God on our side. And my wife advised me, you know, if you got people dropping out of that class like flies now, you'll drive out of the room with this. Awesome. I mean, just the music playing in the office. <laughs> and then I was going to play a little bit of a Monty Python Spanish Inquisition skit, just to break the tension. And I kind of talked myself out of that one because. 
We don't have any none of this still out there. Nobody respects the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, I'm just waiting for those three guys to read it out of the No one expects the Spanish Inquisition. At which point, by the way, as long as you're into it, we can have a look at our dish rack, our comfy chair, and our pillows. If all. Okay, so. Anti Semitism on the rise. 1478, king and queen say, We want an inquisition of our own. Hey, you, you guys out there, you all have inquisitions. Gosh darn it, we want one of our own. We want our own inquisition right here today. So the Pope says, Okay, he sends this character, Rukamada. So maybe he, he had some integrity when, when, when he said, hey, I'm really after the guys who only claim to have hurt. That, by the way, was the Vietnamese. The, the popular sentiment was, hey, these, these new Christians, these Marana, they, um, <coughs> they didn't really convert. They're, they're still practicing their Jewish stuff. They're still playing their drills, for heaven's sake. In secret, they're still wearing the thing on that, you know. It didn't really get worth the Judaism. So it is possible. If you want to think about this as being integrity, that the Pokemon that said, well, you know, hey, my parents, my grandparents, they used to be Jews, but they, they, they were the whole nine yards. Now I'm as happy as they come. What's wrong with these people? Um, I'm not sure why well, I thought this was important for me to know, but I, I just put this in here as a note. Um, yeah, Pokemon Legends was working on a date. So we had kind of a nice run of it. There's a Grand Inquisitor. This was titled the Grand Inquisitor. Um, and uh, he, he died and was buried in the monastery of St. Thomas Aquinas. And um, his tomb was ransacked in 1832, and people who pulled his bones out of, out of the tomb kind of did a mock trial and then incinerated his bones as if he were being burned at stake. Um, kind of interesting, if um, pointless, uh, that you get to think. Um, Man, that's just an aside. Why did they do that to their hair? That looks so silly. <laughs> well, that, that's a thing. I was wondering that. I always wondered that. That, that is. That is you know called, this as well. That is called a tonsure. That's called a tonsure. That uh, when you go ahead and shave the top of your 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 your, your, your head off, uh, it's called it's called it's called a tonsure. Closer to God or something. You're pure and. I don't know. What's yeah, the idea? Yeah, the, idea, the, idea, the idea is to show nothing between you and, and a whole bunch of a whole bunch of reasons, but that's how it's Yeah, like, yeah uh, it, it, it's a it's a look, you know, it's a look. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean can, you, can you imagine like that? Back, back in uh, 
in the 1300s, if we did converge, we had a couple options to be killed. <coughs> we could be asked to leave. And by the way, when we were asked to leave, it meant leaving was just to show you back. Leave your property behind. Leave your money behind. It search you, make sure you got no coins on you. I don't know. Um, so the thought was, well, they didn't really convert because they really loved Jesus. They converted to, uh, you know, preserve their lives. So, the other issue um, that I want to suggest is that we have a newly united kingdom. Okay? Got these two kingdoms, separate kingdoms for many years. Marriage brings them together. But the idea that um, maybe people in one kingdom believe something a little different than another kingdom, they thought that's not good for unity. We need an inquisition to make sure everybody's believing the same stuff. United we stand, and all you need to get the idea. There is um, also another one of the cities that have in here. You see, if, if, if you accuse, well, I'm going to point you to detail about this in a moment. If you were accused in the Inquisition, well, we'll pick on left, we've got all opinions here. Say I accuse Leslie of some kind of heresy. Some, you know, or, or, or not being a real convert. Well, the next thing that happens is we arrest her. And we hold her in the cell while evidence is gathered. And that can take a very long time. In the meantime, we have to feed her, right? I mean, we may not do it. <coughs> Here's some of the land, all that stuff. So, what we do is we confiscate our property. And, and if you manage to put everything into her husband's name, that's okay, they're married, we'll confiscate his property too. And if she's got parents who are alive, we'll confiscate their property as well. Brothers and sisters, well, after all, we have to ensure there's enough money to take care of her all it takes. So, there's a financial Motivation for this. Accuse somebody, take their stuff. Um, it's kind of the ultimate tax, I don't know. Do you know uh, where the Jewish population was concentrated? Was it more in Castile or Arizona? Uh... No, they were, they were um, okay, derivation of this word, ghetto. Ghetto, we think of as like a broken down, messed up place where the buildings are all. Ghetto is just a word originally applied to an enclave where Jews lived. Okay? It wasn't necessarily a particularly bad word, by the way. It was just a description. That's where the Jews live. So the ghetto is here, there. Uh, they, they did pretty well for themselves. They kind of had nice little towns and but there was someone who steals something out of the other one. It's first of all Other questions? Okay. Um, and then finally, along with confiscating the stuff, there's also a desire on the part of the old Christians to remove the new Christians, that from themselves, from public life, the places of authority. Well, wait a minute, how, how come that guy gets to be the mayor? How come that guy gets to be the... How come he's so rich? Well, all this is going on. Pope Sixtus IV. There he is. That's another. <laughs> you know, I, I guess if you, if, you can't, if you can't go for the township look, you go for what, but... I have your shame to hang on the head of it. By the way, by the way, by the way, I, I know you think that's not very professional, it's not very scholarly to make fun of it. You know, but, but as a musician, I have had, since I've been probably 16 years old, when I finally decided to get my relationship. I have had to listen to it as the song goes. Everywhere I go, is that a man or is that a woman? <laughs> well, finally, at my age, I finally get to say, too damn ugly to be a woman. 
<laughs> so, <coughs> um, so anyway, I don't know why I have to come back to that. Just you know, um, no, it, it, he um, actually he decides, guys, hey. Um, Fred, Izzy, can I call you Izzy? Sure. Uh, Fred, Izzy, it's a little rough here. I mean, after all, these conventional states, they, they are ostensibly Christian now. And a lot of them have been Christian for three, four generations already. Don't you think you're being a little rough on them? I, I, I think I want to. I think I want to take over this here. Now, Inquisition, okay, I get it, but I think we need to be a little soft pedal a little bit, is what basically says. A little too rough. At which point, at which point Ferdinand and Isabella say, um, no, no, I don't have a lot Now, in explanation point, you go all over your ass with that. Because what we have here is an example of a secular authority talking back to a hitherto monolithic Holy City. The unified power of Rome. Remember, we're talking about Rome and his order of education. Say, we're going to war, guys. Yes, your boys. All of a sudden, Fred and Izzy say, hey, we want an inquisition. The Pope says, okay. Um, you know, our, our egghead friend here all of a sudden says, you know, that's a little rough. Let's, let's, let's down by that some. The monarchs say, no. We like this. This is working for us. You're not the boss of us. Is this well, the beginning of losing control? It's not the beginning of it, but it's a symptom of it. Yeah. It, it is a symptom of the breakdown. Um, so, and there are all kinds of ironies there, particularly in happening in Spain, which we're going to come to you later, but it, it, all kinds of ironies about that. So, ultimately, the Inquisition of Spain winds up being controlled by Spanish authorities. Not the authority of the Holy See. Okay, 1492, same year, same year, there it is here, 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella order the expulsion or yet another forced conversion of the remaining Jews in Spain. And we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. We'll say they actually believe that, hey, we're doing these people a favor. We're saving their immortal souls. That's certainly what they put down on paper. So the results are twofold. First, we have many of the Jews <coughs> just leave. They leave. Now, a few, not unlike just the beginning of the Holocaust years, those who were somehow connected. Or maybe it has some kind of, you know, intuition. They, they leave, right? Jewish people left Northern Europe, they leave up Germany. Some, especially those who had the ability, who had some money, who had some ability to get on a ship and go, did so. And they managed to take and preserve some of their possessions. They, they, they prepared themselves for this. They left. Then there's a whole other wave of refugees who either because they lack the intuition or lack the resources or both, they leave pretty much with nothing. Maybe a senior trunk, if that. Maybe a, a jacket, if that. Well, a similar thing happens here. Those who read the writing on the walls, those who know what's going on are able to flee with some resources intact. However, by the time it becomes official, by the time it's, uh, the proclamation is announced all over town, once again, it's leave. By the way, please leave your belongings here. 
the Treasury thanks you. So, so that's the kind of expulsion we're talking about. So we have, once again, some Jews leaving, and interestingly enough, some converting. I guess I'm growing an opinion here, but I want, I want you to think about the irony of this. The whole Spanish Inquisition is ostensibly because we don't trust these new converts. So Isabella and Ferdinand say, okay, get out or convert. And now we make new converts, not just nuevos cristianos, but nuevos, nuevos cristianos, new, new Christians. And what does that do to the people? It incites them to even more anger. And this continues on, by the way, all the way through 1530. All the way through 1530, this primary act of the Spanish Inquisition is aimed entirely at purging so called confessors. Um, really, the only heresy that's persecuted at that time, heresy, is being Jewish. Um, where do they go? Where do they go? Where are they going? Uh, the woods, other countries. Um, you know, interesting, interestingly enough, while the rest of Europe is busy fighting heresy of various kinds, being Jewish or even being a Muslim is not such a bad thing. So that may be the that may be the ones. Okay, European position is indeed about heresy. By the way, certainly things that most of us in our day and age would not consider worth being Portugal. But in their minds, it was heresy. Spanish Inquisition primarily against the crime of being Jewish. That's kind of the line. Um, but the answer is they went wherever they could. By the way, the ones who left with their shirts on the back and nothing else, many of those died in the Um So, you think the average pop populace, they were jealous of their wealth and power, how well the Jews had succeeded in society, correct, at this time? <coughs> certainly, certainly that was the yes. And, and the same thing happened in the 1930s, right? They became jealous of, of the successes of the Jews. That's, that's, one, that's one of the things that happened, yeah. That's one of the things. I mean, oh. I know this is very simplistic, mm -hmm. and perhaps I want to oversimplified to try to understand in my mind. But why is it that they, I mean, why can't the Christians try to just do better? I mean, why do they have to be so jealous? And yes. What is it that, uh, you know, is it in the culture of Jewish families to just, you know, you know, have their children try to achieve more? I mean, I don't know. You, you hear well, all their history. If you really are looking for a Genesis, a spiritual, cultural, psychological archetype. Understand this. Hey, by the way, this is a commercial. <laughs> I was commend to you a book okay. by a theologian by the name of Rene Girard. Uh, the book is okay. entitled The Scapegoat. Okay. The Scapegoat by Rene Girard. This is not an easy read, by the way. Um, one thing, guys, for one thing, the guys, uh, French has to translate into English, unless you speak to be French. Um, and translation is always a tough thing. And um, Gerard's uh, quote is very, very dense. But, um, but if you want to understand that it's one extremely sound psychological, cultural, spiritual theory on why this happens, I would commend to you the way that Gerard. Gerard and understanding of scapegoating theory. Oh, the scapegoats, right? Okay. Um, comes from a number, a number of things, um, not the least of which was a Jewish practice, by the way, ironically enough. Um, what's here? We think all our sins, and we heap them on the back of some hapless goat, and we drive out of the woods. Symbolically, not actually, symbolically taking away our sins, as if we want our sins to be banished from us. Um, 
Another interesting point that we will get into this other class, but um, the goats in the Greek, is a prodigal. A prodigal is a goat. But we got our word tragedy. So all those things connected. Scapegoating, tragedy, misery. Um, okay, finally, long last, the Lutheran connection. There he is. Um, after 1530, there's a new word. Protestantism. No, of course, 1530 is not the date that anybody's mind of the Protestant uh, Reformation. However, it took a little while. It took a little more than a decade to start worrying about it in a real way in Spain. All of a sudden, they're worried about Protestantism. And now, and here's one of the ironies. For a variety of cultural reasons, <coughs> Protestantism never really took off. It's you know, we talk about Protestantism in France, we've got the Huguenots, we talk about Protestantism in you know, Northern Europe, why we've got Luther, we've got Sweden, we've got Calvin. We talk about Protestantism in England. The Spanish Protestant Church, anyone? The Spanish Protestant Church. Well, maybe, just maybe, some more scapegoating. Because over the course of decades, they may have found the entire country. 400 actual incidences of the crime of Protestantism. So, what do you do? You want to keep this Inquisition going. And why would you keep the Inquisition going? You want to do business. Nothing like a scapegoat to unite people. Well, at the time, let us say um, that uh, 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 Peggy really did get into a bar fight. <laughs> and and the bar fight that she got into was with the brother of a priest. And as Peggy is slugging the hit on what out of this guy, she says, you know what? And I don't like your brother, the priest, either. Because he's I don't know, really a Marhaw. Well, if somebody in the floor had heard me say that, she could have been rounded up for Lutheranism. Because you see, in those days they applied the term Lutheran or Protestant to anything that was deemed as something to the church. So, in other cases, Guy's walking out of the tavern one day, he's had a few too many. Not that I know anything about this, but there's an old expression. It's kind of long when we get paid. When you drink a lot, you can never really own beer. You just borrow it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the guy walking out of the tavern, he's really drunk and nature's call. He looks around, what he's watching, the sun's going to let nature do what nature needs to do. Except it happens to be on the steps of church. Hmm. Guess what? He gets accused of being Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, if all of this sounds like the Inquisition kind of just lost its sea. It, it, it went from something fearsome to something almost ridiculous. In a way, it is on a historical level that's true. Unless you're one of the accused. Unless you happen to be the accused. Then it was a lot of that. Um, Looking now, sort of, sort of, kind of page eight. Um, looking at, uh, maybe it's even page nine here. Uh, the mechanics of this. 
But real quick, how does this even work? Because <coughs> you understand the process, a lot of misconceptions. Here we go. Um, what is just one inquisition? We found a lot. Many inquisitions. Inquisitions were local, particularly on a town by town or district by district basis. Here, here's what happened. Um, you had a, uh, uh, someone who just requested, someone in authority. Either someone in authority of the town or someone outside saying, hey, they want to hire this in town. So an inquisition would be announced in the town. And typically speaking, at least in the beginning, there was something called an edict of grace. And what that meant was, okay, we're going to have the inquisition here in Vieira. Vieira is full of heretics. I mean, man, this town. Full of heretics. We're going to have the inquisition. However, for a period of 40 days, 40 days, we're going to have a grace. And that means that you yourself, your conscience follows you, you yourself know that you are a heretic. You can go to your confessor. We'll set this up in a convenient location. You can confess your heresy, do some penance, and as long as it doesn't do bad, you can be under it. That's a typical way to watch. Later on, by the way, you're going to be of grace. Our first, we have the of grace. You can go ahead and confess this, and it will be okay. Um, then, what would happen is we go ahead and start gathering evidence. <coughs> Why these heretics? And what have they done? And those who did not already confess, which would be no sufficient evidence, were arrested. And all of their all the prison, by the way, their property impounded and so forth and so on. They're now arrested. And now they're waiting for trial. Now, in our culture, I'm not sure this is the way it always works. But if you're in the legal profession, I'm probably to think it's the way it always works. I know it's the way it's always supposed to work. The idea of a trial is what? Well. Determine guilt, innocence, mitigating circumstances, extended guilt. The idea of a trial is supposed to be a reading of truth. Well, in the uh, Middle Ages, not just the Inquisition, but any court, but, um, guilt was determined by evidence. If the evidence against you, it's obvious you're guilty. Now, I suppose if you have some mitigating circumstance or some hidden evidence of your own, you might, but then you are, be able to overturn it. But for the most part, once people start gathering evidence and the powers of peace say, hey, we have enough evidence, by the time you come to trial, it's no longer about are you guilty or innocent. It's about getting you to admit you're guilty. Possibly a lot of that. You think? <laughs> um, yeah. The, um, yes. Um, the, again, that's uh, probably why I was, uh, depending on who you are. Um, so now we, now we go ahead and try to say, hey, how, are you guilty? How guilty are you? And um, it's perfectly okay in the mind of medieval people, at least the ones who are doing it, to extract the nominal truth by using torture. Lots of methods of this. I chose not to go into detail, but they are. Um, by the way, if you, if you want to find out about what kinds of, um, uh, if you can tell me if you're curious about this, or not, you want to learn out, please check your sources. Because there's a lot of wrong stuff out there. There's a lot of Hollywoodization. Sometimes making it way worse, sometimes making it not really bad. But, uh, I really didn't want to do this video in a class on humanities 
full to you in great detail. So just let's leave that for now. Um, <coughs> suffice it to say that it's an interesting things. One of the methods, by the way, uh, that they use, that I found interesting, um, uh, apparently, and we have some interesting sources in the Latin, it wasn't translated, it's not any better, but uh, the method was to um, tie somebody down and stuff a rag in their mouth and start pouring water over their head, sitting like ground. <laughs> And we didn't start the fire. Um, that was the only one, by the way. There were far more recent ones. Um, Anthony, did they do anything like they did, and this is years ago, that when I learned about the Salem witch trials, they would put like women in a chair and tie them or something uh, uh, to the chair and put them in, in, in a, like a creek or a running river and say, you know, if you can pull yourself out of this, then, you know, you're, 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 you're a witch. If you can't, you drown, then well, what you're, you're, what you're talking, about, talking about is, is a form of, of, of a trial by ordeal. Okay. So the concept of which uh, was something that the tradition had stumbled upon somewhere in the fourth century, for the end of the fourth century, trial by ordeal. Uh, that was an example of it. Um, you know, the most famous example, trial by ordeal, is something similar to uh, what he was talking about. Oh, she's a witch. Well, how do we know she's a witch? Well, yada, 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 this happened. Well, we don't really know. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take her, we're going to hide her hand foot, and we're going to throw her in the pot. And if she floats, we're going to pull her out, we're going to dry her off, and now we're going to dump kerosene all over her and let her on fire. Because witches float. Yeah. Never goes back. On the other hand, if she drowns, she wasn't a witch. Well, if she wasn't a witch, we'll give her a good piece of garbage. <laughs> okay? Um, early, early, as in Constantinian era Christians, one of their favorite versions of trial by ordeal was if you had a new theological concept or a divergent theological concept, well, here's what we're going to do you embrace your new concept, and then we'll cover you with. You know, free a cell or a pitch, or something that burns really nicely. We're going to find a fire out. And we'll set down a fire. However, uh, in this case, if you are burnt to, you know, an unrecognizable hulk, then obviously you're going to be allowed to do wrong, and, and we'll try you, you know, obviously as a heretic. But if you survive, it means that God proves that you would go all over the way. Trial by your people. So uh, this is this is slightly different. This is this is torture to get someone to uh, come to earth. Now, you may say to yourself, or a person would say, well, and in my way, lawyers would to say this. A confession gave while torturing someone, but well, well, how legitimate can that be? I mean, for some people, if you're tortured, I guess you have a great, strong constitution. I mean, maybe you'll, you'll just you won't hurt yourself. But how much pain in the average should be in pain? Well, a person going to say anything. Well, the church and well, no, 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 no. They were tortured to show them the error of their ways, and actually, we stopped torturing them for minimal to speak. So, actually, they were the right mind. They weren't actually being tortured for speak. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, torture, by the way. Um, you know, Hollywood movies, you know, you see like, a, you know, tackling, uh, you know, tackling monks and evil looking priests and so forth, like, you know, lining up the ladder. Um, not, not, not quite so much. Uh, torture typically was done by the Russians. Only supervised by the church. They hired professional workers. Um, accused typically given three opportunities to admit wrongdoing. Interesting enough, the Spanish Inquisition did allow the presence of a lawyer or other legal counsel. Um, not a whole lot of, not a whole lot of news there. Um, lots of things came up. Uh, charges for, uh, 
various social sins, uh, you know, all the typical uh, suspects, uh, bigamy, various kinds of behavior, uh, public drunkenness, all might get in trouble. I'll uh, also give you all these minor penalties. The uh, torture by the way is not a penalty. That was the same truth. We can bring this to the concept of the Alpha Fay. Alpha Fay is something that is active Fay. And, and that's how the Spanish Inquisitional trial would be called at the trial, presumably after the mission of guilt. You get a bunch of these folks who committed, committed crimes, who did. We would have a solemn procession. And bring them out in the middle of town. And we'd say mass. And we have a prayer service. All of them with great calm. One of them with color. And um, and then we would read their promise, the accusations. And again, they'd be given the opportunity to publicly repent. Now, with minor crimes, they were given their penance, and you know, it might include some punishment right there, might include some time in prison, might include whatever the civil authorities, this was the civil authorities of the side. Those who refused of heresy, and that may be a true special condition, um, the only option was to use death. Now there were two ways that would go to If during or immediately following this out of day, the person admitted to their crime of being Jewish and were willing to repent of this and return to the true religion, they would be guaranteed and then burned and sick. On the other hand, if they refused to repent, they would burn the stake without being guaranteed. Give me. Uh, Garroting is taking something uh, convenient, like a thin rope or a panel wire or something like that, and bringing it out of your throat and um, cutting off your um, throat. Slightly different than the hanging, because in, 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 uh, in a classic hanging, the, the cause of death is often the actual um, rupture, because there's a drop involved in the classic hanging. Garroting uh, is, is a somewhat smaller process. Uh, so those are the choices. If you confess and repent and become a Christian again, We'll, we'll, we'll guarantee it, and then we'll burn you. So you won't have to suffer a penalty for a while. But then if you don't repent, we'll just burn you to say. Uh, wow. So, you may ask yourself, well, well, how is it that the people who believe in the love of God can justify this? The answer was something like this. Well, if they were Jews, they were God about a high. So even though they had to punish for the crime, you know, if they confess the last minute and turn back, well, they still have to pay for their crime, but hey, at least, you know, you won't give it up. On the other hand, if they refuse to confess, they refuse to turn back, then honestly, that being burned at the stake is, 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 is just, just, just kind of getting used to what they're going to be facing for eternity anyway. So why, why work? Um, let's see. What preponderance of cases were, I mean, that they, they were burned? I mean, how many did they let off? Um, basically. The number of executions in the Spanish position number of thousands. Um, estimates, it, the estimates uh, vary somewhat um, wildly. Uh, if you go to uh, Roman Catholic sources, uh, sorry, they'll tend to be less. Going to classic Protestant sources, they'll tend to be more, and we'll see next week uh, the Inquisition becomes a huge, huge opportunity for Protestants to talk about the evils of the Catholic Church. Um, if your history, if any encyclopedia or history books you had at home is older than 1960, um, you probably have 
all kinds of stuff with it. It probably is all that accurate. The scholarship on this event is it's still in progress. It's still in flux. We're still learning things about this. Um, you know, what happens is, again, you have a primary source. You say, oh, that, that's also what happened. That's what happened. You have another primary source, and it contradicts that one, and now we have to have our own trial by our people. Which one is going to be believed or neither? So, questions? Considering who they picked, you know, whether you're talking about the, this, this whole process, whether it's Spanish or prior European immigration, really affect your culture, your sciences, your arts, when they take you a lot of these foreign free thinkers and stuff that were actually. Yeah, that would be cold. It's not a tradition. Yeah, you know what? You're, What's, what's that you say? You, 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 you think that the Earth isn't the center of the universe? Very good. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, pure opinion. Pure opinion. But a well founded one, I didn't just myself. Of course, I didn't say that. <laughs> When religion resorts to violence, it follows almost invariably is a cultural retrogression. Religious violence has begotten things like the sacking of the library and all that. Religious violence. Uh, on the other side of things, we'll see in the next two weeks, um, the iconoclast movement destroyed some of the medieval period's greatest works of art. Right? Protestants saying, we don't want any idols, we don't want any organs, we don't want any stained glass windows. And they smash the iconoclast, we literally smash the idols. Um, Consider, if you will, you don't imagine such a thing, but you don't want to imagine such a thing. The Crusades didn't happen. Or they didn't happen the way it happened. They ended a lot earlier. They ended with a truce that was real. And all of a sudden, knowledge from the East. Remember, this is a seriously more advanced culture than any other one. Finds its way into the West. What if 4th and 5th century Christians did not suppress the knowledge of earlier cultures because it contradicted, contradicted the newly arising state religion? What if? Where would we be? On the other hand, what we've seen is that each time this happens, things go backwards. They can show books. Keep in mind they had indoor plumbing in Crete 150 years before the birth of Christ. We get indoor plumbing in England and the United States when? In some places, not in the 20th century. Um, the ancients could have told you that sanitation was important. The church made theists that bathing was not as simple as that. Okay, other questions? In your documentation there, you say there was about 2,000 yeah. converts that were proven to be practicing the Jewish religion. Yeah. How did they go about finding? Well, you know, when they say when they say prove, they meant proven to their own satisfaction. How? Well, we need to use Some of them think they're very silly, some of them make sense. Um, so you're praying to be a Christian, right? You're praying to be a Christian, and your day of worship, not your Christian, is what? Your day of worship is Sunday. But when you're a Jew, your day of worship is what? 
And what did you do or not do on Saturday? Work. Work with anything. So if um, it's a cold day and I'm walking down the streets in your house or the fireplace, not the big place, and I look up and I see smoke coming out of your chimney, and, 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 and your house has smoke coming up out of the chimney on Saturday, and so does yours, but I get to this couple here, and there's no smoke coming out of your chimney on Saturday. I know the authority. There was no smoke. It was 30 degrees out, and there's no smoke coming out of your chimney. There go. They must be Jewish because they wouldn't pull the fire. That was one of the things that was used. Um, what else? We're having a nice town picnic. Nice town picnic, and you know what we're going to have? We're going to have pulled pork. Yes. Yum! <laughs> All of a sudden, the guy who looks like me says, well, obviously it looks like you could eat anything it would. And you don't have to go that hungry today. Then over here, seeing chowing down on the pickles and the, but not that one. Don't you like pork? You get the idea. Now, Conclusive proof would then come, we go ahead and we search the house, and we find copies of the Torah, uh, yarmulkes, things like that. That would be considered proof. That would be the evidence. Um, so keep in mind, the number of people involved, and relatively few people were even actually proven. Yeah, I think of my point is, that's a small number considering the, the amount of People actually suffering this. Um, other questions? Okay, if not, thank you for your time, for your attention. I want to close with you the prayer. Father, we thank you for, for continuing to guide us. We're children of the soul, and we ask that they take root in our hearts and our minds. We also ask that you might send us forth from this place in the palm of your hand, the center of the world. We ask for Christ's name. Okay, thank you all, and uh, thanks to you for having us in our class.